Praise ye the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. I'd like to appreciate Pastor Obasike and his wife, Pastor Mrs. Esther Obasi Ike. I've known them for possibly 25 years plus, and I want to thank God for the exceptional grace of God they carry. Exceptional grace of God they carry, which is now made manifest globally. Big congratulations to you on your 25th anniversary of Global Gospel Week. I want to thank God who started you off in ministry. And he that began a good work, we give that work acceleration in this new dispensation. Thank God for your beautiful wife, a very precious daughter of mine and daughter of Zion, Pastor Mrs. Esther, Dr. Mrs. Esther, I would say, because she's an academic, an intellectual, and a very, very powerful anointed woman standing behind the giant man that has shaken the entire East Africa. You haven't seen anything yet. You are just beginning. And by the grace of God, the next dispensation will be more exciting, more powerful, more impacting, more revolutionary. New grace will be downloaded upon your life and upon your ministry. The next one year, no one will believe you are still the same person. Because God is going to shoot you like an arrow to the four corners of the earth. The grace you carry will find global expression in every continent of the world. Your own personal barriers and limitations are broken in the precious name of Jesus. To so the congregation, I say congratulations to everyone especially those who began with him 25, 24, 20 years ago. And of course, I know quite a lot of the workers there, the ministers have been there almost three, four, five times. He had pleaded with me to come over physically, which I declined because of certain reasons. But because of Pastor Obasike being precious to me, I agreed to do this recording against all inconveniences, extreme inconveniences, but I still agree nonetheless because it is him I said I'll do it and by the grace of God by the time you're having the 26th anniversary or 27 if Christ has not come we'll be there physically. So we want to thank God for all of you over there in Kenya, the grace of God that started with you will never expire in the precious name of Jesus Christ. I've been speaking on the subject breaking limitations placed by bad luck. Breaking limitations placed by bad luck. And I'm so happy because Anyway, Pastor Obasike is a deliverance minister. He's a prayer minister. So he understands the African situation, the African troubles, and the panacea for the African dilemma. Bad luck is not limited to Africans alone, but it's more prevalent in Africa because of certain traditional factors, certain foundational factors, we have a lot of people carrying bad luck all over the place. So, I love the subject and I've written a lot, I've taught a lot, ministered a lot about bad luck. And I believe by the special grace of God, anyone carry the yoke of bad luck, that yoke shall be broken in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that your grace shall be sufficient 
for this session. I pray that you release a commensurate anointing to power this meeting from the beginning to the end. That every man and woman shall profit their Baha in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, precious Father. We ask in Jesus' name. Many sufferers from the affliction of bad luck hardly know that they have a brief problems in the hand. Many of them hardly know that they have a big problem in their hands. This force or spirit called bad luck operates so imperceptibly, secretly, stealthily that one would think that having many disappointments in life is just one of those things. People explain it away philosophically. Yes, one of those things. I had disappointment, I had frustration there, and they just dismiss it. Not knowing that they have a problem in their hands. And Syria, disappointments indicate a problem somewhere. Syria, disappointments indicate a problem somewhere. Bad luck as a phenomenon, as an oppression, as an affliction from the evil one, makes those who should be rich to remain mysteriously poor. Those who should be rich remain mysteriously poor. It makes those who should be helped to remain helpless and stranded in life. Those who should be helped, they remain helpless and they are stranded in life because they carry bad luck. But, unfortunately, many don't realize what they are carrying. Bad luck places an unusual and unwarranted embargo or limitation on human destinies. Embargo, limitations, rights, you have a threshold of destiny you cannot cross. You are limited. There's an embargo, there's a blockage on your way to progress. Bad luck is sometimes responsible. Bad luck causes men to walk amiss in life. To walk amiss. People miss their timing. Alright? Because or bad luck. But let's see what luck is defined. How luck is defined. Before you talk about bad luck or good luck or ill luck, how is luck defined? Luck is defined as an unknown and unpredictable phenomenon that causes an event to result one way rather than another. Alright? The result should be this. But unfortunately, your expectation is disappointed. The result goes the other way. Okay? It's a phenomenon, a force that sometimes we cannot explain. You expect this to happen positively and all your hopes, aspirations are pinned to it. But unfortunately, it goes the other way. Luck is also defined as an unknown and unpredictable phenomenon that leads to a favorable outcome. Okay? Favorable outcome. So luck is not predictable at all. It's like a pendulum. You can swing this way or swing that way. Other words for luck are chance, fortune, or fate. Chance, fortune of faith. In the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 9, verse 11, King Solomon said, I return, and I saw under the sun that the rest is not to the sweet, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, neither riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happened to them all. He said, I saw under the sun 
that the race is not won by the fastest runner. Sometimes a fast runner can fall, can stumble, something can happen. All right? He can trip and some assault and somebody takes over. It's unpredictable events in life. And he said the battle is not won by the strongest army. By the strongest army. You can ask Israel and the Arabs. Most times the Arabs have an array of weapons. Sophisticated Soviet and Russia tanks, jet fighters, MIG fighters, SU fighters, and all of that. And Israel looks overwhelmed. But in two, three weeks, by the time the battle is over, Israel has walloped a confederacy of Arab armies. It happens several times. So most times, battles are not won by the strongest army. Sometimes it is determined by luck. That's what Solomon is saying. When you say someone is fortunate, you are in the really say is lucky or he has good luck. And I pray for everyone that is listening to me. In life, you shall be fortunate. In life, fortune shall smile on you in the precious name of Jesus Christ. When somebody fails an interview or an exam, he should have passed. Or loses again, he should have won. People say to him, better luck next time. Better luck. That's another word. You don't have luck in this game. In this exam, there was no luck that attended to you. I say to every one of you, every examination and interview you shall attend to any time from now, luck will attend to you. I said, luck shall attend to you. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, every game you play from now on, you shall have luck. 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 So from the passage we quoted, King Solomon seems to be suggesting that success or victory in life is made possible by some element of luck. Element of luck. You must carry it. You must carry it. Element of luck. And I pray for everyone hearing me from this moment I receive a baptism of luck. A baptism of law. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Lift up your hands and say, I receive a baptism of luck. Say, I receive a special baptism of luck in my life. Go ahead and pray. Yes, Lord, I receive a special baptism of luck. In any way I find myself, anywhere I go, luck shall attend to me. I receive a baptism of law, an aroma of luck in the name of Jesus Christ. So shall it be. Receive what you have asked for in Jesus' precious name. Hallelujah. Manifestations of bad luck. Manifestations of bad luck. What? When someone suffers disappointment or failure in a venture, we often hear their sympathizers respond with statements like bad luck, tough luck. This suggests that bad luck is associated with failure, disappointment, misfortune, or tragedy. I say to you, no one will say to you, better luck next time. I say, in the name of the Lamb of God, no one shall say to you, better luck next time. The first time you attend that interview, you shall pass gloriously. The first time you attend that examination, you shall pass gloriously in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Secondly, bad luck can be defined as that which causes chronic misfortune, repeated tragedies, program failures, 
That law can be defined as that which causes chronic misfortune, repeated tragedies, and failures. So, when tragedies are repeated, okay, regular repeated, then you know that a force beyond ex explanation is at work. Alright? When you are silly a failure, despite the fact that you are brilliant, despite the fact that you are studying hard, and yet failure attends to your examination or to your interview, something is wrong somewhere. Luck may be far from you. Three, that luck is a human experience that is associated with things going wrong when and where they should not. Things go wrong when and where they should not go wrong. In your life, nothing will go wrong again. Everything shall go on according to plan. Your aspiration, your plans shall not be frustrated, shall not be disappointed in the precious name of Jesus Christ. For when bad luck is at work, things that should naturally work out we fail to work and ventures that are very risky every risky to succeed we end up in failure I tell that again when bad luck is at work things that should naturally work out we fail to work and ventures that have every reason to succeed we end up in failure lift up your hands say every venture on my hand in the name of Jesus, I speak to you. Good luck, good fortune. You will succeed. In the name of Jesus, the work of my hand, the venture of my hand, shall not end up in failure. In the name of Jesus. Five. With bad luck, people that should not have any business with failure or limitation we suffer chronic limitation and failure. Chronic limitation and failure. All because the oil of bad luck is at work in their lives. And these are people that should have nothing to do with limitation. Embargo. They should rise and rise and rise like a skyscraper in life. They should move in life with the speed of a bullet but they are mysteriously slowed down they are limited a man that should be a 30 story destiny skyscraper remains a bungalow or two story dwarf in life mysteriously embargoed and limited in life but when you see him it's a bundle of potential he looks Futuristic, he looks somebody that is ready to explode, but he never explodes. He's bottled up, no expression of the destiny. From this 25th anniversary, your destiny will explode. Your destiny will explode. You shall have expression of destiny in the precious name of Jesus. Lift up your hands, say, I receive. From this anniversary, destiny expression, destiny explosion, destiny expression, destiny explosion, destiny expression, destiny explosion. So shall it be in Jesus' precious name. And then number six, with bad luck, people missed or waste their strategic opportunities. Waste their strategic opportunity. And I see so much of that. So much of that in the lives of people. I watch carefully because this is a very topic that I've been teaching for the past 30 years or so. I've written a lot about bad luck, good luck, fortune. And I see people that I secretly cried for because the opportunity was wasted. Door they've been waiting for opened. But at the time the door opened, they were nowhere to be found. They knocked and knocked with fasting, with praying, but then the door opened. Where are they? They are nowhere to be found. You will have a few testimonies and the Lord will help you that you will not waste your opportunities. Because when a man wastes his opportunities, he wastes his destiny. 
destiny is frustrated when opportunities are wasted. Seven, many have squandered their Cairo season due to the affliction of bad luck. Many have squandered, okay, their Cairo season. Kairos means a time of visitation. Kairos means a special time of grace. Kairos means the appointed time or the same time when heaven is ready to pay a man a visit. When God comes massively to help a person. That's a Kairos season. And the opposite of that is Kronos season. There are two major seasons in life. Chronos, C-H-R-O-N-S. Chronos means available time, regular time. Okay? In Nigeria, this is 4.15 p.m. It's a chronos time. A time we go to work, a time we sleep, a time we drive around. Chronos is a general available time. Okay? The work that you do at Kronos gets you minimal result, except you are extraordinarily hard working. Before you get much result, when you work at an ordinary time, Kronos time. But then the other time is Kairos. Kairos means a special time opening within a time, a divine time opening. When God pours grace upon what you do, and the result is so 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 phenomenal that people can't believe it's the same you that worked at Kronos time. Okay? But Kairos time does not last forever. Kairos time is for a season. Okay? It might be 10 seconds, 20 minutes, one hour, one week, a month, two months, one year, two years. I believe like other people believe that the redeemed Christian church of God is presently in their Cairo season. And that I share with Adigio this January and I say I believe like many others that our CCG is operating at Cairo season. And I say daddy I know you know it. That's why you are walking so fast running so fast planting churches everywhere mandating our CCG ministers and workers and pastors to literally capture the whole world because you know Cairo season does not last forever I say he looked at me he's like how did you know this but I've studied so hard I study churches okay I study the move of God in churches but our CCG Skyros time is the longest in Nigeria so far. There was a church I know that got they planted churches everywhere and all that, but it didn't last one of 15 years and the glory died down. Okay? Then another church that preached holiness took over despite the toughness okay, of their message. Everybody flocked. Everybody flocked there and they planted churches all over the corners of the earth here and there and all of that and all that. And it didn't last more than 20 years. Alright? The Akaro style reverted back to Chrono style. You have to work hard to make any significant progress. But as I see now, I guess for almost 25, 30 years, they have been breaking barriers globally, globally, globally. Whatever they do literally succeed. Go to the camp. The way you left the camp last year is not the way you meet it this year. It's amazing. And it's not the only redemption camp. There's redemption camp in UK, redemption camp in America, and in different parts of the world. It's a Cairo style. And you listen to me. In Africa, especially in Nigeria, wherever you see a signboard, RCCG, human beings will go there in number. He respects you who the pastor is. He may speak bad grammar. He may dress shabbily. It doesn't matter. Something compulsively pulls them there. Something magnetic pulls them there. It's a carol stand. The heavens are open. Unfortunately, some pastors think that all oh, the success, the population, the growth is because of my fault. No, sir. You are operating under a Cairo sign. The heavens are open generally. So, it's irrespective of your effort and personality. Hallelujah. May God give you your own Cairo sign. In the name of Jesus. And I believe the mission and the ministry of Pastor Basiki and his wife is entering into a dimension they've never known before. It's their Cairo season. 
they are just graduating. I'm talking about their individual ministry, their personal. They are moving from Kronos to Kairos in this new season. Mark my words. It's a season of exponential growth. A season of exceptional performance. A season of global impact. So shall it be in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, some miss their carol's time. They miss it because of bad luck. Can you imagine? Alright? The man by the pool of of Bethsaida. I think that's John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Scripture said the man was there 38 years. He saw Kairos style, but he couldn't kill into it because he was handicapped. And the Bible says, okay, at a certain season, certain season, Kairos season in the original, an angel came, stirred the water, and everybody had, all right, he has the standing of the water. Brrr, the water is there. And they know that the heavenly messenger has come. Deposited healing power, healing virtue, healing fire inside the water. Scripture says, Whosoever touched the water, no matter the degree of affliction, the affliction disappeared instantly. Okay? So, a whole lot of people clustered around the pool. Some never slept for two weeks. Okay? It's like a case of like running a relay race. On your march, set, go. People stretch their legs toward the water. Overnight, two days, waiting to hear the sound of the staring. Okay? When the water is stirred in the opening of time within time. Alright? A microcosm of time. That's a Cairo style. Okay? When God came down massively, deposited healing power into the water. Opening of a time. He it may be 10 seconds, it may be a millisecond, whosoever thought the water, but a millisecond carried away the healing, and immediately after, time goes back to chronos time, no power in the water, you might even jump into the water and swim, the way you enter will be the way you come up because you're operating at chronos time, the canal, canal season has closed up for 38 years, this man missed his Kairos time until heaven smiled on him by special mercy. I pray no one, because of bad luck, will miss their Kairos season. Thou shall not miss your Kairos season. Lift up your two hands. Say, in the name of Jesus, I will not miss my Kairos season. I will not squander my Kairos season. Begin to pray in the name of Jesus. I will not miss my Kairos season. I will not squander my Kairos season in the precious name of Jesus. I will see my Kairos season and log into it and latch into it in the precious name of Jesus. I shall profit from my Kairos season. Say amen, somebody. But the affliction of bad luck makes a man to see the Cairo season and never really enjoys it. I remember I was telling some people there were a few people I wanted to bless in November. Okay, in November, all right. I traveled to my state and I say these people once they get it right, if they walk in the spirit and they are sensitive. And they follow my instructions to the letter, then they will get this amount of blessing, which they have not seen in years. Okay? I was armed with their blessings. So, number one, I call uh, for him to just follow the direction I gave. He argued and argued and complained and complained, and he said one thing or the other. My heart was beating for him. And I said, simple job, simple assignment for him to carry it out for me. And then he will get a blessing he has not touched maybe in one year. Argued and argued. Eventually, he said, Sorry, sir, I can't do it. I can't do it. Somebody very junior to me, all right. And I say, ah. I tried to beg. He said, No, he turned it down. The other person also, in fact, that person became insultive. Insultive. So and I told mommy, see again, bad luck at all. They might have been praying for this blessing to celebrate Christmas. And I come armed with their blessing. Heavy amount of money in the hundreds of thousands of naira. Okay? That's about talking about maybe one thousand dollars per person to just spend for their Christmas. But they blew it up. I cried inside. 
I couldn't help them. So I pocketed my check. And I said, there they go. Not knowing that something is afflicting them. There are people like that who miss their blessings, who miss opportunities to be blessed because of what they carry. Place your hand on your head. Say, oil of bad luck. Dry up. Oil of bad luck in my life. In the name of Jesus, dry up, dry up, dry up, dry up, dry up, dry up, dry up. lobo sutalia. In Jesus precious name. Number eight. When everything about a person. Appears physically okay. And yet the fellow keeps suffering. Tragedy. An embarrassing failure in life. But luck is indicated. Nine. When a woman is beautiful. And well educated professionally successful and well mannered but cannot secure a life partner at an advanced age bad luck may be responsible I have seen those who you consider not beautiful at all those in Nigerian parlance that we cannot buy for two cents okay marry at the altar and the husband handsome well to do so and cross with this woman at the altar looking at her a thousand and one times as they are about to be joined together love flowing but we see those who are beautiful, stunningly beautiful who can win a beauty contest sisters, but then nobody is looking in their direction it might have to do with bad luck it might have to do with bad luck then when a football team dominates a match in all departments of the game and yet loses the match at the end that lord may be responsible and we see that in africa particularly in nigeria all right we hardly prepare well for any event particularly in this part of the world okay the western world if an event olympics or commonwealth games is four years to come the preparation starts today not the african man particularly here in our country they wait and wait and wait and wait possibly until six months and then they start running around the whole place everybody running and all but we are a praying country and most time we get away with it you see a national football team ill prepared you know with bad technical advisors and coach and then they get to international scene one way or the other luck shows up because people are praying because prayer generates good luck are you listening to me prayer, the altar of prayer generates good luck, just like satanic altars generate bad luck one way or the other, they get to international matches, win this match win this match against advanced countries who are prepared, I mean I remember a game when we were 4-0 down in Saudi Arabia flying eagles, okay, in those days four goals down and uh, some are already turned off their television set and radio set some were money already and uh, they just say it's over, it's over, it's over by first half okay, by the first half we already four goals down uh, people say a final match final match against USSR I remember against the old Soviet Union, Russia so everybody says it's over for Nigeria and during the half time the coach took them to the dressing room all right, at the pep talk, at the pep talk, pep them up, pep them up, puff them up, spoke to their heads and folks who never give up on the altar. Nigerians were praying tongues in the dressing room. All right, those of them Christians, all right, from Nigeria, the fan club, all of them were praying tongues, praying tongues, praying tongues. It's like they were generating bad luck. The Soviet people came, like I said, radically to the second half, say 4 0. How can they recover? So, this is an African team with one of them were going away with it. And before you could say, Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, whoop! 
They got one goal. That was a tonic. Everybody was screaming some assault. Another 20 minutes after, another goal. Then new energy came upon the flying eagle boys and we see they started play and started play and then the third goal and then finally they equalized. The Soviet people were downcast. They were depressed, demoralized and before they could get over it they scored another goal. We won that match. We won that match. We got the cup. Praise the Lord. Why? Because good luck attended to the flying eagles of Nigeria. I pray for you. Where you have been written off, good luck will show up. Good luck shall show up in the name of Jesus. When men say it's over for you, luck will step in. In the precious name of Jesus. What afflicted the Soviet team, the Russian team was bad luck. Failure at the edge of success. At the end of success, they counted them as successful. I'm sure in Soviet Union, in Russia, folks will be jubilating, celebrating, but they lost the match. In Christ's holy name, you will not lose a final match of life. Amen. Number 10. Bad luck is at work. When good things finish always when is your time when good things finish they are distributing rice distributing things okay and you queue up or in Nigeria as we say when there is French shortage and the queue is two kilometers some the people spend four days at gas station waiting for petrol to buy and sometimes when four comes at midnight, everybody is by, everybody is by, and all 200 vehicles ahead of you bought their fuel. You are number 201, okay? And when it's your turn, suddenly say, I'm sorry, the fuel is finished. Or sorry, light goes out and we don't have generator. That is bad luck. Now, we call it accident if it happened once. But if that dogs your life, if that's the pattern of your life, then when good things are being served and you're on the queue. It's when your turn that they say no more promotion. When it's your turn, they say money has finished. Something is wrong somewhere. You are carrying bad luck. Bad luck is at work, number 11. When your hopes and expectations are always dashed at last. Your hopes, your expectations, your aspirations are dashed at the last moment. That is bad luck. No other name. That is bad luck. And of course, when you have these problems cumulatively, alright, there's an embargo on your progress. There's a limitation. You can't go further. You want to rise. You want to move. But to see this invisible embargo is there. Cumulative failures, cumulative disappointments, cumulative frustrations, alright? One way or the other, they impose a limit on your life. Even ministers, some I see pastors who have this problem without knowing they have a problem. All right, a bad luck, imposing a water limitation upon their lives and upon their ministry. I stand on this altar. I break the limitations. I break the limitations. I break the limitations. I break the limitations. The limits are taken away. Limitation is taken away. Embargo is taken away. Roadblock is clear. Move forward. In the name of Jesus Christ. That log is at work. Twelve. When you are always victimized for no just cause. You are always a victim. You are always a victim. It's not ordinary. It's the oil of bad work. Bad luck at work. You are always a victim. Okay. Victimized. Maybe a, pro a, a problem arose in the office. Something has gone wrong. And you are not involved at all. One way or the other, when they do investigation, that Lord will make them to zero it on you. And you may be arrested or punished for a crime you never committed. Alright? When they are distributing promotion, you are the hardest worker. Okay? Everybody knows that you work and you love the company or the institution. But when it's time for promotion, they find it so easy to bypass you, to ignore you. That is not ordinary. That's bad luck at war. Pray. Raise an altar. Bomb midnight candle. 
and defeat the spirit of bad law. In this new dispensation of Pastor Obasike and his wife, in the name that's above everything, every bad luck in the house, Jehovah God causes their time and tenor to expire in the name of Jesus. 13. When bad luck is at work, your deal and benefits are always given to another. <laughs> Your deal, your benefits given to all the people that never paid you and sat when deal, your entitlements, your gratuity, your pension, they will serve other people and over and, and overlook you. It's not natural, it's not ordinary. 14. Bad luck is at work. When what is easy for other people becomes difficult for you, becomes difficult. What others do and achieve with effortless ease, but for you is tough, is tough, and eventually that issue becomes an abandoned issue because you can't just get through it. You can't just get through it. Bad luck is at work. And other people enter into that. Everybody that does it succeed, but when it's your turn, it becomes a no go area. It is bad luck at work. 15. Bad luck makes nonsense of beauty, talents, training, ability, opportunities, advantages, and qualifications. <laughs> Bad luck makes nonsense of beauty, talents, training, ability, opportunities, advantages, and qualifications. You can have lots of them. Your CV or resume must, may be heavy, impressive. But if you carry bad luck, you won't find ready market. You won't find ready market. No one hires you. They just at best they say you will hear from us. We shall get in touch with you. We shall get in touch with you. We shall which they never do. Which they will never do. Why? Because bad luck is at work. Meanwhile, your resume is so impressive. All right? It's so impressive. But bad luck at work makes nonsense of a beautiful lady. No man will look in that direction because bad luck is at work. I say again, the regime of bad luck in your life expire in the name of Jesus. Lift up your throat. Say regime of bad luck. Regime of bad luck in my life. Your time is up. Expire. 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 The tenor of bad luck. Open your mouth and pray. Yes, Lord, in the name of Jesus. The tenor of bad luck. The regime of bad luck. Limiting my life. Limiting my destiny. Frustrating my progress. Expire. 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 Moro bobo bo santo. Moro ndi kriando. Maliki Thomas sandali kataya. Ande iku tumaha. Maru se vira. Maru se difrenende dia. Lift up your two hands. Say tree of bad luck. Tree of bad luck. Fall down and catch fire. Tree of bad luck in my life. Father, catch fire, catch fire, catch fire. You evil tree that bears evil fruit. Father, catch fire, 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 find fire, catch fire. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. 16. People suffering from bad luck are never the places of their blessings and help. Never are the places of their blessings and help. They are always missing. On the day, blessings are waiting there. Always missing. I'll give you a passage very shortly to just see what I've just said. People suffering from bad luck are never the places of their blessings and help. Their help 
or help us are either ahead of them or behind them. Something keeps them from meeting. After this message, you shall meet your helper. Thou shall meet with your helper. The Lord will connect you with your helper. The help you have been waiting for. The Lord will connect you. Thou shall be connected with the help you have been waiting for. The help you have been praying for. Thou shall be connected with your help and help us. 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 The Lord shall order your steps. Jehovah 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 shall order your steps. The steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. Lord. May the Lord order your stay in this season. May God order your steps. Shout three times, say, Father, order my stay. Say, Father, order my stay. Roy Gilly Thunder. Jehovah God shall order your steps in the precious name of Jesus Christ. So when my Lord is at work, People miss their help and their helpers. The next point the satanic forces responsible for bad luck have a way of keeping people away from their divine blessings. The satanic forces responsible for bad luck have a way of keeping people away from their divine blessings, timings, opportunities, and helpers. The next point. If not properly addressed spiritually through prayer, the affliction of bad luck can make one miss or appointed season and wander endlessly in life. If not properly addressed spiritually through prayer, the affliction of bad luck can make one to miss is or appointed season and wander aimlessly, limited forever in life. And say again in the name of Jesus, you shall not be limited in life. Limitation is taken away. All barriers are broken in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Come with me to the book of Judges. Judges and chapter 13. The book of Judges chapter 13 from verse number 2. And I was a certain man of Zorah of the family of the Danites whose name was Manoah and his wife was barren and bear not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman, the wife, and said to her, Behold now thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now therefore beware, I pray thee, drink not wine, nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son. No rest thou shalt come on his head. And for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Verse 6. Then the woman came and told her husband, say, A man of God came unto me. And his countenance was the countenance of an angel. was like the countenance of an angel of God. Very terrible. But I asked him not where he was. Then I told me he is named. But he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son and now drink no wine, no strong drink. Then I eat any unclean thing. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Verse 8. The man who entreated the Lord and said, Oh my Lord, let the man of God without this sin again come again unto us and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. Praise the Lord. Now, we see a problem. A woman and a husband had waited years for the fruit of the womb. They prayed and prayed and prayed. And finally, mercy smiled on them. God sent an angel to announce the good news. Your prayer had been answered. And you're going to have a destiny child, and it shall be a Nazarite. These are the conditions for the child. An angel met the man on the field, perhaps on the farm, slaving for the entire family. The husband wasn't there. Where the husband was, scripture did not say, but the husband wasn't there. Okay? But the angel met her at the place of her work, 
I said, good news. Congratulations, madam. So madam got home. I told the husband, Danny, good news. An angel told me that our child is coming. He rejoiced, but he said, I'm the man. I shall be the first recipient of the information. All right. Thank God the angel told you, but I want to hear it to know the authenticity of the message. So, pronto. He said, oh God, I know you told my wife about the good news. All right. But I'm the head of the family. Please, can I have the same strategic information, prophetic information? Oh Lord, let the angel that brought the news come again. Come again. He prayed. And that's what many people do. They pray for a blessing. They fast. In Nigeria, they go to the mountain. They go to the wilderness. They do retreats. They do so much Fiji. So many Fijis. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Sometimes, when the answer is about to come, or the answer is about to be delivered, many of them are never at the place of their answer. Something mysteriously keeps them away. I've seen that several times. And I know, each time I see it, I know bad luck is at work. But the carrier of bad luck does not know that something is wrong with him or her. So, just like Mr. Manuel, he didn't know that he had a problem. Chronic bad luck. He prayed for the second chance. He said, Lord, I missed the first opportunity. Give me a second chance. Let the angel come again. I know you are a God of the second chance. Pay me a visit again. Now, if I were him, now that heaven specializes, he give me advance information to my wife. I will follow my wife everywhere she goes. So, if they saw me before they went to my wife, I told my wife the good news. So, which means heaven seems interested in my wife. If that be the case, all right, she had found favor with heaven, just like Mary. I'll follow my wife. Now, Madame had gone to the farm. The husband also did not follow her. Follow me in verse number nine. Verse eight said, Manuel entreated the Lord, said, Lord, let the man of God, the angel you sent at first come again. I need a second chance. And verse 9, and the Bible says, God akined unto the voice of manner, and the angel came again. Let me pause here and say to those of you who lost the first opportunity, God will restore that opportunity. Jehovah shall restore that opportunity. You miss it at first, it shall come again. It shall come again. It shall come again. The God of the second chance shall visit you. The God of the second chance shall visit you. In the name of Jesus, lift up your hands. Say, Father, come again. Say, Father, visit me again. Say, God of the second chance, give me another chance. Go ahead and pray. Yes, Lord, I need another chance. Pay me a visit again. God of the second chance, where are you? Visit me again. Visit me again. In Jesus' name. Now you must know that when God sets a precedent, when God sets a prisoner, it means that we can log into it, we can launch on it. A prisoner has been sent here. In other words, God is a God of second chance. You miss the first opportunity, you stupidly and foolishly lost it. It can come again. We can recall a miracle. This is what I call miracle rewind. The Lord gives you a miracle rewind. In the precious name of Jesus. Scriptures say, the angel came again, verse 9, unto the woman, as she sat in the field, as she sat in the field, as she sat in the field. And the Bible says, Bet, <laughs> Bet, Manoa, her husband, was what? She was not there. He was not there. He prayed for a miracle. Miracle was being delivered, but he was not there to receive delivery, to receive the miracle. This is chronic bad luck. Chronic bad luck. But thank God, it was a time of mercy. You know, angels are merciless. Angels are merciless. No excuses. They don't pardon your iniquity. God told Israel, I said, my angel ahead of you. Obey him. All right? Follow his instruction. Because he shall not pardon your iniquity for my name is upon him. <laughs> so, but in mercy, the Bible says, manna was not there. And you know what happened? 
the mercy of God in operation. What happened? The woman begged the angel, if it's Nigeria, she will have nailed her. Man of God, please wait here. Detain the angel. And the angel said, all right, agreed. She ran home. I don't know how many hours. The distance between their farm and their home. Okay. And called the husband. He was there. He said, the angel are come again. Will you follow me? So he hasted up and followed on the angel was there. He said, angel, Mr. Angel. He didn't even apologize. Mr. Angel, what did you tell my wife? And the angel reiterated all that he said. The lesson here is that a number of people who have bad luck, they don't know. Are you with me? They are never the place to receive delivery or the prayer of the miracle they prayed for. They just miss their blessings. In the name of the Lamb of God, whatever it is that makes you to miss the blessing you prayed for, I rebuke that spirit. I command that power over your life to break in the name of Jesus. All you labor for, you shall harvest there. You shall harvest the blessing. Lift up your hands. Say, in the name of Jesus, I take delivery of every miracle and blessing I have prayed for. Say it again. Say, in the name of Jesus, I take delivery of every blessing and miracle I have prayed for. Say, I take delivery of every miracle and blessing I have prayed for. Come on, pray it out. Say, I take delivery. Stretch forth your hands. I take delivery. Lord, I'm waiting. Lord, I'm waiting. Lord, I'm waiting. I'm waiting to take delivery. To take delivery of my miracle, of my blessing that I pray for. I fasted. I waited for. I've longed for. Yes, Lord. I shall not be like Manuel. In Jesus' name we pray. Another example of bad luck before I close. Second Chronicles chapter 18, 28 to 34. Second Chronicles chapter 18, 28 to 34. Second Chronicles chapter 18, 28 to 34. Praise the Lord. I say praise the Lord. Second Chronicles chapter twenty-eight, chapter eighteen, twenty-eight to thirty-four. Now in this passage, <coughs> all right, <coughs> several hundreds of prophets, false prophets, have told King Ahab, go to battle against Ramon Gilead. For the Lord shall deliver them to your hands. The Lord shall deliver. You shall win a battle. You shall win a battle. But he said, there's a man here. He doesn't speak any positive about me. I hate him. All right? But Joseph said, let's hear from him. So they brought the prophet, Micaiah. And Micaiah said, the Lord showed me that you lost the battle. And Israel soldiers were scattered on the mountain. They are like sheep without a shepherd. And moreover, you died in battle. And one of the first prophets slapped and said, how can God talk to you when he saw me? How can God talk to you? King, go to battle. You're going to win. The Bible says God has arranged to kill him in battle. So he listened to false prophets. Okay? But now we see the end of the battle here. Verse 28. So the king of Israel, Ahab, and Joseph, the king of Judah, went out to Ramon Gilead. And the king of Israel said to Joseph, I will disguise myself and I go to battle. But put on thy royal robes. Put on thy royal robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself so that they would not know he was the king. Follow me carefully. He carefully he wanted to pass the death sentence to a righteous Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat was what you call Mumu in Nigeria. A fool, a buffoon. All right? He just agreed like that. Let's change our royal garments. Because Micaiah the prophet has said to him, You will die in battle. All right, even though he rebelled against that prophecy, that prophecy, but he believed it will come to pass. So fear, he said, okay, if death is coming, I will dodge this death. I will transfer it to another person. In battle, when the king is meeting, the battle is over. And in every battle, all right, they look for the commander of the army or the king. So, Jehoshaphat, momentously, 
foolishly agreed to remove his own royal robe and wore that of Ahab, and Ahab wore that of the king of Judah. They are not the same type of robe. All right? And all the enemy nations knew each other. They knew the robe they wore. They wore. So they got to the battlefront. Okay? Verse 30. He said, The king of Syria had commanded the captains of the child of that were with him. Say, Don't fight the small or great. Fight only the king of history. <laughs> it came to pass when they saw Jehoshaphat, they thought it was the king of history. Therefore, they surrounded him to fight. But Jehoshaphat cried out, and the Lord helped him. So they identified him that he was not the king of history. And he escaped. Are you following me, everybody? All right? And he escaped. Then, verse 33. Verse 33. I love my translation, but it's not here. He said, But a certain soldier drew a bow. Adventure. Adventure means, all right, he drew his bow haphazardly. What did he do? He just fired. It's like firing an AK 47. It's like, all right, the target was not the king they were looking for. Ahab was hiding somewhere. And he wanted them to kill Joseph. But being a righteous king, the Lord saved him in the day of trouble. So he rode his horse away. Now the army of Syria were frustrated. How can we come to the battlefront and we cannot get our targets? Oh, so the Bible says one soldier got angry and took his bow. All right, at least they will say, I fire one bullet, I fire one arrow. The Bible says, Adventure, a pass that day. What translation say, Amy at nothing in particular. He just fired the arrow, Amy at nothing in particular. Let me just spend one bullet. At least I came to the battlefront, let me waste one bullet. So he fired in one direction and listen to what happened. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I say praise the Lord <clears throat> verse 33 and a certain man drew a bow at a venture and smote the king of Israel the Bible said the arrow located the king of Israel where he was hiding it hit him in a place where his armor had an opening between the leg and the waist Okay, penetrated his back and the king of Israel shouted I'm hit, I'm hit blood was gushing out blood so he slumped into the chariot even though they prop him up to fight to the end of the day, the Bible says at evening he died according to the word of my God. But what I will say, it was bad long they killed him. Alright? They didn't know where he was. The soldiers were not aiming at him. He just wanted to waste an arrow. Fired a passard lay, not aiming at anything in particular. And the arrow located a king that was hiding. Bad luck. Bad luck! It tells me the story of a man in a neighborhood of a city in Nigeria. Armed robbers, armed men were operating. They were firing to the air, scattering everybody. People scamper in different directions and they stole whatever they wanted to steal. You know, in the neighborhood, in the supermarket and all of that. They kept on firing, firing. And a man who lived a distance away, who was apparently watching the television, but when he heard the shooting, all right, the noise of shooting, and he said, what's, wait a minute, what's going on here? So he went to the balcony. What is going on here? Where are they firing? And he leaned on the railings of the back balcony, looking here and there. And a straight bullet of the robbers that was fired, all right, located him, broke his core. He fell down in the balcony in a pool of blood and died there. No one else was killed in the robbery. He was the only one that died. All right? One made him to leave his sofa and go to the balcony and peep a battle that was not his own. Arm robbers did not come for him. They came far away. He just peeped. What's happening over there? And they pull it located. What do you call that? Bad luck. In the name of Jesus, this year, you shall not walk amiss. Thou shall not walk amiss. Say it loud. Amen. What causes bad luck? One, disobedience to God. Disobedience to God, we open doors for demonic oppression and affliction. When we disobey God, some things in our life may refuse to work, no matter how much we try. Genuine repentance, mercy prayers, and deliverance prayer is the solution to this. Number two, causes. Causes who work against the success or good fortune of the victim turn into a misfortune. Demons working with these causes we harass the victim with experiences of bad luck. After repentance, maybe restitution, 
and maybe restitution have been done. The causative cause must be identified and broken intelligently and prayerfully. Causes, causes, causes. Now, if you go to 1 Samuel chapter 2, 27 to 36, Eli's sons, Ophni and Phineas, Eli's son, Ophni and Phineas, isn't it? Isn't it? They were misbehaving terribly. They committed adultery. They stole offering. There's so many things that pastors, high priest sons should not do. And God warned him, warned his son, they won't listen. So, again, God sent a man of God to tell Eli. Say, Eli, your children are crossing the red line. And by the time they cross the red line, all right, no sacrifice will be able to atone for their iniquity. I'll visit you. And I place your family under a curse. All right? All your seed everybody coming after you will become a beggar. No one will live to old age. And I take the priesthood of you. Alright? You may be the last of the priest because of what you have done. So God left a cause in that chapter. And the cause jumped the first generation, jumped the second generation, jumped the third generation. A fourth generation man that was high priest who just thought what he was doing was right. Abiata. In 1 Kings chapter 2 26 to 26 to 27. All right. Adonijah declared himself a king instead of Solomon the prophecy and said will be king. Okay. And things started turning against Adonijah. Seas started turning against Adonijah. All the conspirators were arrested. Some of them were killed. Adonijah being the priest. Okay. Solomon came to him and said, Well, you supported my father when he was running away from your senior brother, Absalom. You carried the ark. For that, I will not have you killed. But because of your role in supporting rebellion against me, I take you off priest too. You will no longer be priest. Go back to your village and become a farmer. The Bible said this was spoken to him to fulfill what the Lord declared to prophet, to priest Eli. Fourth generation who didn't know anything about what happened to Eli. Bad luck caught up with him. You will not suffer for the sin of your father. In the name of Jesus, I say you shall not suffer for the offense of another. Lift up your hand and say, I shall not suffer for the transgression of another person. I shall not suffer for the offense of another person. In the name of Jesus. Bad luck makes you a victim of an offense you did not commit. Of a crime you did not commit. How many people are in jail now, arrested after the criminals have left? Policemen will get their gra 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 and they arrest everybody they see. The criminals are not stupid. Once they commit a crime, they bolt away. And policemen most times don't come at the right time. When they come with their siren, okay, and they're all bo 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 and shooting to the air and making all kinds of gra 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 gra. Anybody unlucky. Okay, we battle on the farm and they are cutting away, dumped in police cell the next day into the prison. Some spent nine years, some spent ten years, some died there. For face, they did not come in. Why were they there at that time? Bad luck. Why were they there at the crime scene at that material time? Why were they passing by? Bad luck. I say this year and ever, the Lord shall order your steps. The Lord shall order your steps. Number three, causes of witchcraft. Causes of our Lord. Witchcraft attack. Witchcraft attack. Witchcraft powers can bewitch a fellow or a certain aspect of his life or life, thereby frustrating every attempt at success or progress. The solution to this is to identify the witchcraft pattern and strategy and then dislodge it using relevant scriptures in prayer warfare. Witchcraft attack. Somebody say witchcraft attack. I'll tell you that story when I'm done in a few minutes. Okay? About a man in church that was under the spell of witchcraft who missed his season. Number four, evil altars. Foundational or territorial evil altars can place an anti success embargo on their victims, making them to experience bad luck in life or in venture. Any victim of this must address the distant evil altar by counter altar of authoritative dominion and deliverance prayers. Evil altar. Somebody say evil altar. 
The other time I say, if altars can generate the oil of bad luck and sponsor the spirit of bad luck. How many people are suffering? I'll tell you a story when I close from the Bible. How an evil altar, okay, dealt with a prominent man. He wasn't a bad luck before. He enjoyed good love for a season. Then bad luck took over. <clears throat> Five, powers of negative retribution. Powers of negative retribution, retribution, powers of negative retribution working with the law of swine and reaping may be contending with an individual in order to ensure he reaps the harvest of evil seed he has sown in the past. Serious deliberate repentance and restitution, if possible, is required before the victim can successfully pray the prayer of release. So prayer of release must appeal to God for mercy. To God for mercy. Powers of negative retribution. You are sown the wind, you are not reaping the white wind. What a man sows, he reaps. What a man sows, he reaps. So when the time of reaping comes, you are living up your life in sin, in unrighteousness, and the nemesis is cut off with you. Everywhere you go, the door is shut. Everything you do never works because of yesterday, your yesterday. So some people, instead of interceding, interceding, they should keep on appealing to God for mercy, 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 mercy. And go to ministers of God, go to the altar of God and cry for mercy until they see his significant release. Six, glory traders. When the glory of virtue of an individual have been tampered with or siphoned away by satanic agents, the fellow's life will be characterized by experiences of bad luck or misfortunes. Things that should work in his life will simply refuse to work because his life has been tampered with at the glory level. For deliverance, the fellow will need to pray, pray for revelation of what aspect of his glory the enemy has tampered with. This should be followed by relevant prayer warfare and prophetic action. Glory traders. Alright. This may not be prominent in East Africa. Maybe alright. God lives in your country. But here in, Af in our country, God is living somewhere. Satan is living somewhere. <laughs> Righteous people are living somewhere. The Satanists are somewhere. Okay. So, and of course, darkness at all times want to overwhelm the light. Darkness are taught I want to overwhelm light all the time. So if you are the light, you are well packaged and you are well loaded so you can be needed in life. Glory hunters, glory traders will seek you out. Just as Herod the glory hunter hunted for his third child, Jesus that was born. He did everything to locate where Jesus was born in order to kill him. When they couldn't get Jesus, he slaughtered thousands of, of boys, young baby boys under the age of two, looking for one glory carrier. That's how it happens. The heralds are always there, looking for the star child. Okay? All the wise men say, we have seen star in the east and we are come to worship it. You become an object of worship, object of admiration when your star is a real star. And I pray that your star will shine. Joseph was a star. You know what he faced? Glory hunters. He said, Lemon, his ten brothers did everything possible, but for God, they will have caught to that star. So, there are glory hunters. When they see you are a star child, they come after you. And so, when they begin to work on you, you just discover that many things are not working, except you are exceedingly prayerful. You are a serious Christian. Glory traders may exchange your throne. At the altar, glory of one person may be exchanged. Go ask Ephraim and Manasseh. They visited the patriarchal father Jacob one day. One was a glory carrier, firstborn Manasseh. But when the man entered to the realm of the spirit, he changed their glory. All right? There was a substitution. He laid one hand, the right hand, on Ephraim, the younger, and the left on Manasseh. And Joseph protested, My father is never done. And he said, Sorry, I know what I'm doing. I'm changing their glory. This is spiritual prophetic substitution. All right? These young girls shall be more powerful, more fruitful than the older. And so it was. And the Bible says, He put a frame before Manasseh. Manasseh left that place a glory carrier. By the time he left the presence of Jacob, the, the grandfather, his glory had been vandalized. I pray 
every vandalized glory I restore I restore in the precious name of Jesus so they may deal with you at glory level incidentally I have books of prayer of teaching along the line of glory books along the line of good luck and bad luck the latest is this book we are using this year your appointed time has come it's like a 160 page prayer book your appointed time there we told stories and illustrations about the kairos time about the chronos time about glory hunters and all of that hopefully one day your pastor will get the books across to you the last passage we read and i close praise the lord Praise the Lord. Why am I doing all this? I'm doing this because I see that every limitation in this assembly is taken away this year. Every barrier is taken away. Every ceiling they put upon you, every embargo placed on your height, on your growth, in the name of Jesus, they are removed. You will rise this year astronomically you will rise like a big edifice you will rise like a skyscraper nothing will stop you anymore for you all including your pastors are entering to a new season a new dimension of glory a new dimension of ministry a new dimension of grace the grace of God will be busier than ever so the race can be easy the grace shall be busy so the race can be easy in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Now we read the story here in the book of Esther, very clue. I'll summarize the story. We'll pray a little bit, tell you the last testimony, and we're done. Esther and chapter number four. We know the story. 15, 16, and 17. What has happened? Mordecai refused to bow down to Haman, the prime minister, the hater of the Jews, an Agagite, they call him. An Agagite is an Amalekite. Another word for Amalek is Agag. So, traditionally, they were enemies of Israel. And so, Mordecai knew the DNA carry. Alright? The Abrahamic DNA never bows before any Amalekite. They are perpetual enemies. They are afraid. In Exodus 17, God said, I will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So they know that the Amalek, Amalek nation, Amalek nation, all right, is an enemy of God, and God is at war. So for that reason, Mordecai said, Even though I'm a security guard, I'm a gatekeeper, but I will not bow down before this de facto prime minister. When others bowed, he refused. When others bowed, as the man came into the palace and went to the palace of the king, he stood erect, ramrod. He never bowed. And they said, Why do you do this? He said, I know my reasons. We don't bow before the Amalekites of this world. They say, Hey, this man, you are playing with fire. You are playing with fire. And eventually, the fire started. So, when a man saw that he refused to bow, the Bible said he was furious. Nevertheless, he held himself. He had on research, he discovered that Mordecai was for the seed of the Jews. So he said to himself, I will not only kill this man, I will deal with his race. Everyone on them in this land, they are doomed to die. These stubborn people, I'll get rid of the last of them in this land. I'm the prime minister. So he treated the king into signing a decree. He called the Jews that they were criminals. The Jews did this, and they came busy with a lot of kingdom international matters. Couldn't just take time to find out, investigate the truth of the matter. He just swallowed the bait and he signed. All right, so he said, You can do whatever you want. So the man gave the king riders the mercy to all parts of the kingdom, and they said it did. That day was February 28th that year. The Bible said they chose that day through the casting of the poor. The poor is like an object of divination. Object of divination. They cast the poor, right, at the house of a witch doctor. Haman went there and they were casting, scanning the universe for an appropriate time when all demons will be bloodthirsty. 
when there will be certain alignments between the heavens and the earth, when the damage will be total, when the massacre will exclude no one. So they were scanning the heavens for an appropriate spiritual date right from March of that year. They scanned the heavens, the days of the calendar. March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. They crossed to another year, January, and they kept on casting the poor every day. And when they get one day, maybe January 21st, all right, the poor will say, no, he's like the Yuri man to me, all right? The Jews use to know the mind of God. They cast another day, and the demons and the spirit will say, no, this day is not appropriate. Some will escape. Finally, they cross to February, February 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, February 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 20. When it got to 28, there was green light. All through green light. The spirits have said, this is the appropriate day. February 28, the damage, the carnage, the pogrom will be total. So the date was set. And everyone in the kingdom, they say, spoil the Jews. Very resourceful people, they have a lot of money. They were traders, they had gold. Spoil them wherever you are. Go to their house, kill and plunder. That was set in motion. All right? And when Mordecai knew what, it was because of him that law was signed. He cried and cried and cried. Eventually, he found himself going to his adopted daughter, Esther, who is now the queen of the land, and said, help us, help us, help us, O queen, help us, O queen. And Esther said, you know the law like I know myself. You are a security guard in the palace. I know the law of the palace. No one sometimes into the throne room of the king without being invited. And for these 30 days, the king has not sent for me. If I do that, there's only one law. Anyone who goes to the presence of the king without being invited, his head is cut off. I'm not ready to lose my head. I can't help. Ah, Mordecai cried and cried, but sent another word to Esther. Say, you think you will escape because you are a queen, all right? You think we we'll escape? When they finish with us, they come for you because they know your pedigree. They will come for you. But who knows whether you are come to the estate of the kingdom for occasion like this? Okay. But if you refuse, we are seed of Abraham, deliverance and salvation. We arise from other quarters for us. Esther got the message. So Esther said, "All right, for us." To be able to reverse what is on the natural level, it is hopeless. But at the spiritual level, hope, hope is not lost. We have a God of our covenant, the God of ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How do we reach him? Through fasting and prayer. How do we raise an altar? Mordecai, go back, mobilize the thousands of the Jews to fast and pray. Fast and pray. Three days, no one eating or drinking. He said, I and my staff made this in the palace. We will do the same. Raise national altar in your respective dwelling places. Also in the palace, I will raise an altar. Do you understand what I'm saying now? Okay? I will raise an altar. So, prayer and fasting, massive, nationally. Thousands of people started. They were praying. They were praying. Follow me. I'm painting a picture of what I call the wrath of an altar. The anger of an altar. The rough, these are how altars operate. Even though we may call this positive altar to Jehovah, these are how satanic altars are raised to Lucifer and to gods and to deities for the affliction of mankind. The first job of that altar. So we see in chapter 4, 15 to 16 and 17, Esther bade them to return to Mordecai. This answer Gather all the Jews that are present in Susan and fast for me. Okay? Don't eat and drink three days, night or day. I am a maidens will fast likewise. I will go to the king, which is not which is not according to the law. If I perish, I perish. Verse 17. Mordecai went his way and did according to all Esther and commanded. Fasting started. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. In chapter 6, all right, if you look at verse 7, verse 9, verse 8, verse 9, verse 10, I don't have time to go through. All right. Fasting was going on. Then Amen got up and said, it's now time for us to go into action. And I, my personally, we handle Mordecai. You guys can kill the rest of the Jews, but I will handle Mordecai myself. So he erected a 75 foot gallows behind his house in his courtyard. And that guy, I mean, you talk about a gallows 75 feet high, 
Tawani above every house in the neighborhood. Ha! So he wanted to give Mordecai a public disgrace. His body hanging 75 feet into the air. That was his plan. But he couldn't do that because Mordecai was a staff of the palace. He could kill other people, but you can't touch the staff of the king without the endorsement of the king. So he just went to the king, okay, at a time he ought not to go there. Follow me. The altar started working. So he got to the palace of the king, roaming around, roaming around in the evening time. The king probably had a very all right, busy schedule in the day, tired, wanted to sleep, but he couldn't sleep. He wanted to sleep. He took all kinds of tablets. He took all kinds of, you know, uh, medication for sleep. He couldn't sleep. So finally, he wanted to read himself to sleep. He called for the records of the archives from the archives. Record of exploits, outstanding performance, deeds of people in the kingdom. Okay? And their names. And the first one he read, the first page, was how Mordecai exposed an assassination attempt. Two of the bodyguards wanted to kill the king. And Mordecai was privy to it. He knew what they were planning. So he reported to the intelligence agencies and investigated the matter and discovered that ah, an assassination plot against the king had been planned. So they got those fellows arrested and killed and recorded in the record book of performance of exploits. But nothing was done for him. So as the king read it, the Bible says on that night the king could not sleep. As he read through, he roared. What have been done for the man that saved my life? He kept on running alone, not talking to nobody in particular. But all the guards, the personal assistants, were hearing it. So he said, who is in the courtyard? Which officer is in the courtyard? They say, your royal highness, it is Emma. He said, good, let him come in. So he told Emma, what can I do for a man want to honor? And Emma said, I'm the prime minister. The king wants to promote me again. So he made juicy recommendations. King, take your second big embroidered dress, which we call Agbada in Nigeria, a big dress, and then take the man, put him on the horse, the second horse, you ride on special occasion. Decorate the horse, okay, and then let your high-ranking officer get the rope of the horse, let the man climb the horse, and take the man around the city and announce without last speaker, here is the man that the king wants to honor. Here is the man that the king honors. All right, he made that recommendation thinking he was the one the king wants to publicly honor. The king said, Anymore, he said, This is enough and sufficient for the man you want to honor. And the king said, Your mouth has said it. Yours sincerely, I'm going to honor Mordecai, not you. He almost collapsed. And you listen to me. So, what has happened to this man? Number one, he walked amiss. Somebody say, He walked amiss. He should not be at the palace at the time he went there. Remember, the altar was already working. So the man was apparently living in confusion. He entered the palace at the time the king was really tired and wanted to sleep. At the time the king was looking for somebody, all right, to take Mordecai around the city. He walked into that. When bad luck is at work, men walk amiss. This year, you will not be found in the place you are not supposed to be. In the name of Jesus. Number two, he was given a disgraceful assignment. Take the rope. Imagine, prime minister, second in command to the king, to do only slaves, do such things. Take a rope, lead a horse, round the city. A job meant for the lowest of the lowest of men, they gave it to the prime minister. What do you call that? Disgrace. Public disgrace. When bad luck is at work, you are given disgraceful assignments. In the office, what's your junior supposed to do? They will ask you to do You are a senior officer? They know. But just to humiliate you, they just put you in a place where you are not supposed to be at all. Because there is bad luck unaddressed. I pray in the name of the Lamb of God, you will no longer undertake disgraceful assignments. In the name of Jesus. Number three, 
in chapter 7 this is all about chapter 6 when all that has happened in chapter 6 11 then took a man the apparel of the horse and read Mordecai and brought him on horseback through the streets of the city and proclaimed before him thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delighted to honor and Mordecai came again to the king's gate but a man hasted to his house money and have his head covered he has been disgraced three things have happened altar was at work the man was no longer himself now finally in chapter 7 the queen had organized a banquet for the king oh king come to my banquet so they were the king went to the banquet of wine drank himself to stupor ate meal he was very satisfied but queen Esther being strategic intentional didn't say anything she was winning her time and the king said I know you have something up your sleeves my queen what are you asking for what are you asking? All to have my kingdom and we will do for you. Say, if you show me your favor, your royal majesty, come to my banquet tomorrow. Then I will tell you what is troubling me. So, and they say, Emma must come with you. So Emma was so happy. He said, Me again, invited by the queen for a royal banquet. So he got to that place. And then they drank and ate. That the second day of the banquet. He had to his satisfaction. Unfortunately, that was his last meal on earth. <laughs> so when everybody was high up, the king said, My queen, my queen, how long will I tell you? Tell me your bodies. Share with me what is your cry. How to have my kingdom I shall give unto you. And the queen, you know when a woman burst into tears, only the strongest of, strongest of men can withstand the tears of a woman kneeling down. Are you with me? You shall be broken except you have eaten the head of a tortoise. A woman weeping and kneeling down supplicating. Except you under a curse as a your heart melts. The queen was in tears. He said, your majesty, I'm as good as dead. I'm as good as that. He said, don't say that again. He said, I say it again. I'm as good as that. You, my queen. He said, yes. And my people also, a warrant of death and beside for all my people to be annihilated all throughout the kingdom and they come for me finally and you don't have a queen. I know my predecessor, you sent her away and also I'm going the same way. So, you shall be queenless very soon. And the king roared who dare do such things how can it happen in my kingdom I'm still alive who is the person he said this a man is your enemy in disguise a man froze and turned white turned white the king was so angry ah! you are one of the people against me you eat and die with me you are my prime minister you want to take over so in anger he stormed to the palace garden, scratching it. What can I do for this treacherous person? What can I do to this man? What can I do to this man? While he was there, praise the Lord. Madam, come. Just, just walk here. They know you in Kenya. You have been there before. Praise the Lord. You sit down. Sit down here. All right. It's too far. Sit down here. Praise the Lord. Why the king was at the palace garden, okay? Palace garden, thinking of what to do to this treacherous person, to this traitor. The Bible says, Haman knew that the king was angry and that the odds were against him. So he rose up from where he was and went to where the queen was. Queen Esther was reclining on a couch, on a couch. So he went there and did like this. Oh, queen, mercy, mercy, queen, queen, help me beg him, help me beg him. Oh, plead with your husband, help me beg him, help me beg him, help me. Now, if a photographer takes both of us now, they won't know I'm preaching. If we're not husband and wife, and it comes out in the paper, are you with me? And I don't have a microphone in my mouth, they will read many stories, isn't it? So while he was pleading for his life and begging, the queen, the king came in, and the king said, "Yea, 
What other evidence do we need? Even before my very eyes, he wants to rape my wife. He wants to rape her. He wants to. He kept on shouting and he believed it. He wants to rape my wife. Come and see him in the palace. In the new day. So all the guys came in and saw him like prostrate. Before King could say anything, the Bible said they threw a hood of death across his face. In other words, you are done for. You are dead. You are dead. You are dead. And why they were leading me away? The king said, Habona, one of his admirers, the admirers of Emma, who admired him before, now became an enemy. In the day when bad luck comes to the market, friends become enemy. All else will turn against you. Habona said, Your royal majesty, this same man, this same man, Mordecai, the one that exposed assassination attempt against you. He had the temerity to erect a 75 foot gallow in order to kill Mordecai. Are you listening to me? That the two people that exposed assassination attempt, he wants to take care of the man that exposed them and kill him. In other words, he was the one that sponsored the assassination. And because one man exposed them, he wants to get rid of that man. And he has erected a 75 foot girl. The king said, What? So is the ringleader of the conspirators? Take him to the gallows and hang him there. Three things. Bad luck, did you? Number one, are you listening to me? Remember in the city, prayer was going on in every house. So the altar was massive across the city and across the nation. Number two, in the very palace, Esther and her maidens were fasting and praying, ran claw. So there was an altar, altar outside, altar inside the palace. Mordecai walked into that altar like walking into a trap. He walked into that altar. And the moment he got to the palace, everything started working against him. Are you listening to me? Praise the Lord. I said, Praise the Lord. I said, Praise the Lord. I said, Praise the Lord. In the palace, the first thing that happened to him, he entered into multiple errors, multiple mistakes. When a man commits unpardonable errors, bad luck may be implicated. Number two. His good intention was misinterpreted. He was begging, he was pleading, he wasn't out to rape the queen. But the king said he wants to rape my wife openly. His good intention was misinterpreted because bad luck is at war. The altar they raised afflicted him with high dosages of bad luck. And you listen to me. That's how altars afflict people. When negative altar is at work, raised by Satanists and your enemies, this is how people walk and means. This is how the place of work, your good intention is misinterpreted and say, wait a minute, what's happening? What did I do? Another a satanic altar may be afflicting you. All right? We sacrifice day and night with a judgment day and night. So you could make mistakes. Number three. Abona and all the servants of the king in the palace who once adore, celebrate Haman. Now, in the day of his trouble, they came against him. When friends suddenly become enemies, search yourself. What is happening? What is happening? Haman was so unfortunate in the city. The altar afflicted him. In the palace, the altar afflicted him. Altar sponsored bad luck is the most dangerous, the most wicked. And I pray for all of you listening to me. Every altar generating bad luck raised anywhere in this nation, Kenya, in this city of Nairobi, collapse and cut fire. In the name of Jesus. Raise up your two hands. Say every altar sponsoring bad luck 
against my life wherever you are collapse catch fire collapse catch fire collapse catch fire collapse catch fire others in nigeria others in uganda others in ethiopia others in malawi others in south africa others in egypt others in ghana others in kenya race against me others in saudi arabia others in kuwait others in Qatar. others into the water others on the mountain others on road junction others on the cemetery others on the water side Kula! Catch fire prayer in Jesus precious name Say amen, somebody. Many of you have heard this story in Mr. Stanley. Okay? You heard this story before. A faithful brother that was always in church one hour before every service. He will be there. He will be there. He will be there. Ahead of other people. And he had a particular seat, just like many other folks, that he sat in the church. And everybody knew him for that seat. And he was a very diligent, faithful worker always but he was very poor very poor abnormally poor he begged to eat he begged for offering nothing worked for him so the pastor and the, and the wife prayed unto god god this man is so faithful he does everything given to him but he's so poor how can we set him up and set him on his own to stand so god told them what to do take a general offering in the church without mentioning names and collect materials, shirts, shoes, and other, wrap everything together, including cash and check, and put it on the seat where he sat all the time he came to church. So the pastor did as instructed, only himself and his wife knew what was happening, and they collected that offering for the past how many years? He has never he had never missed any service. And it will be ahead of post, people cleaning the chairs and the desk and the altar, doing everything, sanitation department, cleaning the toilet, all that. So they just believe we've been church. So God said, put it on the seat and put a label there to the man that always sits here. And they put it on the chair. So the Sunday they expected him to come and take whatever the package for him service that was starting 8 o'clock by 7 or 6 30 he was at the church but this day mysteriously for mysterious reason it was 6 30 he wasn't there 7 o'clock he wasn't there 8 o'clock the service started they couldn't find him husband and wife were looking at each other where's he where's he where's he where's he ah. and the service progressed 8 30 9 o'clock 9 30 the choir was singing preceding the message the message was preached the man was nowhere to be found on that day. And his gift was waiting on the seat. This is a life story. Ah, what is happening? Where is he? Did he travel? Did he fall sick? Is he stranded on the way to church? There is no rain today. So what's the problem? Finally, the service ended. And they were going to welcome the visitors. And there were so many in church. So they brought the visitors to sit on all these designated chairs. And there was only one visitor, visitor that didn't get a seat. The church was panned out, so he was going around, the horses were looking at any available seat, any available seat, and they saw one that had the man that sits here. So they asked the pastor, excuse me, sir, can we ask these visitors to sit there? They looked around, there was no seat, and the Lord said, let him sit there. So they took down that gift, put it on the ground, in front of the chair, and ushered the visitor to sit on that seat. So they welcome all of them, sang for them. Pastor came, prayed for everybody, and then they gave them their gifts, their little, little books, and the, the pamphlet of the church. So they let them out. Everybody was going to be counseled and prayed for. So when the man that was also there was going, he took the baggage. It's like the wife wanted to start off and say, sorry, it's not for you. The husband heard it because the Holy Spirit said, tell your wife not to collect it. Tell your wife not to follow it. So they followed the man with his eyes until he entered the counseling room. After the counsel and prayer, he took the baggage and started off. 
and husband and wife kept on looking. God said, don't collect it for him. The man for whom it meant is not worthy. Not worthy. It disappeared. It disappeared with the the wife was shedding tears. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Where's the man? Where's he? Oh my God. And they mourned in the house for him. the following Sunday. Guess what happened? By 6 30, he was in church. He came the following Sunday. Where was he on the day of his visitation? Where was he at his Kairos time, at his appointed time, when his destiny would have changed completely? Because what the package there was in order to set him up for life. But somebody else took what was meant for him. He wasn't there. Whatever took him away is called bad luck. Lift up your two hands. Say, in the name of Jesus, I declare my freedom from the power of bad luck. I declare my final freedom from the power but look from the power and affliction of bad luck. I will no longer be limited. That man is limited forever. He can't go beyond the level of poverty. Alright? He remains totally sunk in poverty. Lift up your hands. Do a meaning deliverance. Say, Thou foul spirit of witchcraft, sponsoring bad luck in my life, expire prayer with crap power, sponsoring bad luck, altar of bad luck, generating the oil of bad luck in the name of Jesus, altar. Collapse, catch fire. In Jesus' name, we pray. Two more prayers. Lift your hands. Say anointing of good luck to break ancient barriers fall on me anointing of good luck to break ancient barriers fall on me now demand for that anointing the oil to break ancient barriers ancient limitations ancient frustrations let that anointing fall let the anointing fall let the power fall let the man to fall in the name of Jesus I shall pray barriers I shall pray limitations I shall pray ancient restrictions ancient embargoes are broken by the anointing In Jesus name we pray. Even though you don't belong to that church but because you are already harvesting your blessing, join us to pray this prayer. Lift up your hands. Say, in this our silver jubilee from this silver jubilee I recover every good thing I have lost to bad luck. In the name of Jesus from this our silver jubilee I recover Every good thing I have lost to the power of bad luck prayer. 
I recover in the name of Jesus from this silver jubilee of this ministry, of this church, of this commission, of this mandate, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of living God, I recover in multiples, I recover a hundredfold, everything I have lost to the power of bad luck. In Jesus' name we pray. Stretch your hands towards the altar wherever you are. My prayer goes for you that in this new season, Jehovah will do new things in your life. Jehovah shall do new things in your life. Yes. There shall be new horizons you will reach unto. New frontiers you will break. In the name that's above every name, the embargo is cleared. The roadblock is cleared. The limits are removed. The oil of Balak is dried up. And everyone said, Amen. Receive a fresh baptism of good luck in the name of Jesus. I say, Receive a baptism of good luck. Wherever you go, you will have luck. Luck will smile on you. Luck will smile on you. Fortune will smile on you. No longer shall you be called unlucky. No man shall tell you better luck next time. In the name of Jesus, you will not walk and miss. You will not miss the place of your blessing. You will not miss the timing of your blessing. In the precious name of Jesus, go forth and do fresh exploits. Recover everything you lost to the spirit and regime of bad luck in the mighty name of Jesus. For Pastor Basike and your wife, God anoints you with a frontier breaking anointing. The Lord gives you the grace to expand and extend the frontiers of the kingdom of God in distant nations. Nations where the gospel will not be heard, the anointing of God will take you there. The grace of God opens door that no man can shut in the precious name of Jesus. I pray for the members, those who are there who know me and who don't know me. I pray for you. Before I see your face in a short while, you will have multiple testimonies. Multiple testimonies. Ah, what you lost, you will recover in the precious name of Jesus. The God of the second chance arises for you. You have missed opportunity to be promoted, opportunity to get married. You blow your chances. I ask for a miracle rewind in the name of Jesus. I command your miracle to come back. The God of the second chance pays you a visit. He gave Mr. Manuel another chance. The angel came again. The angel of your blessing will come again. The angel of your blessing shall come again. The angel of your blessing shall come again. This is your portion in this new season. In the name of God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Say seven amen like thunder. Thank you and God bless you.